This is Happiness Solved with America's Happiness Coach, Sandy Scarlatta. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Happiness Solved. So I was trying to think about what I wanted to share with you all today, and I usually have to think about something that maybe happened in my day today or over the past few days. And I was thinking this morning there was a situation that I'm not going to go into because I actually talk about it during the interview, but it was one of those moments where, you know, started my day out really peaceful and doing some reading and quiet. And all of a sudden it just shifted and there was chaos in my house, right? So that can happen, right? At any point of the time, any day. And I found myself today, you know, having to push that reset button. So I thought I would just take a couple of minutes and talk about what I mean by that. So all this stuff was going on around me in my house. And I started getting upset with my husband because of something that he had done. And I got him situated. And then the next thing you know, he spilled a whole cup of tea all over the sofa. And it was just like, (sighs) so I cleaned it up. You know, and I went on this 20 second, like, you know, if you're going to own a home, you got to take care of it. You got to do certain things, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then I picked up my coffee and my phone because I was reading off my Kindle app on my phone. And I walked into my office and I shut the door and I just sat there, you know, and just started taking deep breaths. And I'm like, all right, you know, and I start going through, you know, thinking about things I had to be grateful for. And, you know, is this situation really something that's worth wasting any other second of my life thinking about. So in my book, Happiness Solved, I talk, that's a lot of things I talk about is, you know, how do you get back to that place of peace and happiness when life throws its curveballs? balls? Because let's face it, even during COVID, when I barely leave the house, and the only people I'm interacting with is my husband and my puppy, you know, things still happen and situations come up and life's too short to hold on to any of that angst that you may be feeling in that moment. So so this morning, you know, I was like, all right, I'm going to press the reset button. I'm going to press the reset button and start my day over. And I did. And my day has been wonderful ever since. So, and there, there was another thing. And I, I think about this and I've been wanting to share it on the podcast every time I change my trash bag. And I happened to change the trash bag last night. And I was like, ah, oh, when I do my podcast tomorrow, I am going to talk about this very important public service announcement. So, My son is always sending me these little TikTok videos, and I don't get on TikTok, but to watch the things that he sends me because it means something to him, and sometimes it'll provoke a conversation or whatnot. So he sent me this TikTok video, and it's been now a few weeks, and it was this woman, and she had a trash bag in her hand, you know, and you take the trash bag out and you shake it open, and I've always just put it inside, put the thing around, and, you know, you're done with it. Never thought about it. Well, in this TikTok video, and there may be people out there that know this, but for me, I feel like this is a very important public service announcement because I was like, wow, I had no idea. So with a normal trash bag, it doesn't matter, but I have been buying the ones that have that Febreze inside or whatever, you know, so that if you're throwing away things that are smelly, it kind of covers it up a little bit. So this is really important because if you buy the bags with that odor control in it, you got to put it on a different way. So when you shake it open, you put it on like you're putting on a hat. So it's sticking up, you wrap it around the edges, and then you push it down. And when I did that for the first time, and I looked at it, it's like, wow, like, this totally makes sense. And it's just not something that is, like I said, it's not a big deal. I thought it was hysterical. And I'm like, wait a second, how come they don't talk about this in the box? And I went and I had to pick up the box, and I usually buy them in bulk. And I'm looking all over this box of garbage bags, there's no instructions. They don't tell you that. So especially with the ones that have the odor control, they should tell you that because otherwise the odor control part is going to be on the outside of the trash bag and you're not getting the benefit and the five extra dollars it costs to purchase it. Anyway, if you buy the ones with the odor control, you got to put it on in a different way so that you're actually getting the benefit of that odor control. (laughs) So with that said, and I said, like I said, again, it's, it's something so silly, but I just thought it was hysterical. So anyway, my guest today is Sharice Author. Sharice has recently published her very first children's book, which is called Sierra and Star. And she also has a Facebook page that's called Sierra and Star Fan Club. 
She's a delightful woman. After the interview, we actually talked for another 30 minutes, and I kind of wish I kept recording it because we had a really great conversation. But in any event, I hope you enjoy the interview. Hey, Cherise, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Sandy? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So you're on the West Coast. Whereabouts on the West Coast are you from? I live in Beaverton, Oregon, which is a suburb of Portland, Oregon. We're about 25 minutes outside Portland. Nice. It's beautiful out there. I, I, I have not been to Oregon. I've been to Washington State. But that's, it's just beautiful country out there. Yeah, we're blessed. We had a little bit of a snowstorm last week. Not as bad as Texas, but... Uh, we got through that, and now it's just a little bit rainy and and looking forward to spring. No kidding. And we've only got a week left of February. I do a happy dance on <laughs> March 1st of every year. I live in the D.C. metro area, and, you know, we only we have four seasons, but usually there's only like two because you only get a couple weeks of spring, and then it goes right into hot and humidity. Oh, that's too bad. But, um, yeah, but March 1st is such a great day for me because it's like, ah, oh, I made it through February, and we've had some snow this week, but it was mostly like sleet. Mm. And so this morning, my husband got up before me and and I was like, I called in. I'm like, hey, I have a puppy named Buster. He's like 10 months old. Aww. And I'm like, hey, Buster's coming down. And so I said, but I'll be right down. Well, I got down before, you know, he, in, he needed to take the dog out. Next thing you know, he starts yelling. He goes, I just fell. Oh, no. And And the dog was left outside. And so I and it was so icy. And so what had happened yesterday, the temperatures warmed up. And so it was just kind of slushy. And my husband didn't go out and clean it off, right? So now this morning, it's it's not going to be above 30 degrees today. So it is a sheet of ice. And poor man fell. My dog was like 50 yards away. I had to like oh, put on my boots. Oh, and, and I get over there. And the poor little guy, he's a Yorkie poo. He's only 10 pounds. He's like shaking and he's just sitting oh, there because he was afraid to move. Poor little guy. After seeing his daddy fall, you know. Is your husband okay? Oh, yeah. He's he's going to be sore for a few days. Yeah. You know, his bottom, his bottom hurts. He probably, I, I'm a former competitive figure skater oh, and, cool. and coach. And so luckily I know how to walk on the ice. And we used to call it breaking your tailbone. You would fall in like a sitting up position and your tailbone, it was like bruised. And it, we used to call it breaking your breaking your butt. And so I think that's what happened. And he's going to survive. But yeah. Anyway. No fun. No fun, though. <laughs> no, no. And, I'm, and of course, I'm just like, this is your fault. You should have been out there yesterday. But whatever. You know, it's COVID. We're not going anywhere anyway today. Yeah. <laughs> so... We'll all be happy when COVID is over. <laughs> I know, I know. So, um, Happiness Solved, this podcast is all about, you know, I, I want to share, the, there's so much negativity in the world and people are suffering. And so this is all about spreading happiness and stories of where people have struggled and got to the other side and, and what that was like and how they did it. So you mentioned kind of briefly, I, I don't like to get too many details before I speak with someone, but you just mentioned that you had to deal with quite a lot. So talk to me about that and, and how you got through it. Uh, sure. Um, I'm trying to think of which story to start with. <laughs> um, oh, I know. We all have a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of one this morning and I thought I would bring up. I had worked at, at an agency for quite some time and had a coworker who was having some issues unbeknownst to me. And he was just kind of really aggressive. And I worked in a team. There was, you know, like myself, I was the administrative assistant and there was like seven or eight of us. He was really demanding. So one day he walked up to me and, and said, I need this like, you know, today. And we had this system where it was like first come, first serve. You know, it's like, okay, I do this project, I get to another project. So I just said, you know, I, I'll get to it, you know, probably at the end of the, you know, in the middle of the day. He goes, no, I need it now. And I said, well, I, you know, I, I, I'm right in the middle of another project. And he just flipped out. I mean, like, you know, I stepped back and he basically just tore up my cubicle. I mean, just went ballistic. And that was like, I mean, like physically ballistic, like physically, physically ballistic, like <sighs> things were thrown and I could see I, I was a little uh, terrified, you know, because he was a big guy. You know, I didn't think he'd hit me, but it's like he just went mental. And so I saw my boss kind of peek his head out of the office and I walked over there and I said, you need to deal with him. I said, this is unacceptable. 
So it just didn't turn out to be a really good situation. Um, basically, they blamed me for the whole problem. You know, it's like, oh, it's the woman's problem, not the man's problem. What year was this? This was back curious. in 1999. I think it happened, so that's it happened in 98. Still. And I left there in 99. But but that still seems a little late for that type of conduct to be oh, acceptable. It, yeah, in the workplace. it was not a good situation. But something that was really negative, actually, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because, I mean, I liked working there, but it wasn't like my dream job. You know, it was a good job. So once I kind of got through all that, I mean, you know, got a lawyer and, you know, I mean, it got pretty bad because my boss wouldn't deal with it and, you know, just stuck their head in the sand. Now, how did that make you feel as a woman, though? Let's talk about that for a second. I was because angry. <laughs> we still have a lot of hurdles to climb. Right. And, you know, and here we are in 2021, and we still have a lot of hurdles to climb. I mean, how did that make you feel oh, as a woman? Like, it, Well, it actually kind of empowered me, <laughs> to be frank, because I thought, you know, because I just thought, I will not put up with this. It's like, we as women shouldn't have to put up with that kind of behavior. And I kind of took the motherly role with my boss. I said, look, I said, I don't know what's going on with him at home, but I said, you know, none of us should have to deal with that kind of behavior. It's unprofessional, number one. Um, it's intimidating. It's creating, a, you know, a hostile work environment. And it's like, I said, I won't put up with it. And so I went to HR and the boss, you know, kind of, uh, you don't know, I don't know how to deal with it. Kind of like a guy thing. I, I don't know. It just, it was just ridiculous. That's crazy. I've never, I've never heard anybody talk yeah. about that much hostile environment. Well, in the and what came out actually was very interesting. So I, I wound up, you know, filing a claim against the company. And when we went through the deposition part of the process, we found out that there was some serious things going on in the house at home. Like he and his wife weren't getting along. I don't know if they were, you know, just in the middle of a divorce or what. He had two children under the age of 10. And I don't know if there was some physical stuff going on there too. But some things came out that I don't think my boss knew. But it, you would think, you know, as a manager, he would have sat down and said, hey, you know, this is unacceptable. We can't have this kind of behavior. And is there something we can do to help support you if there's, some issues going on in your life or whatever. And that's what human resources is, is supposed to do. Well, yeah. And they didn't do that. <laughs> so, yeah, kind of a sad situation. And then oh he did goodness. at one point try to apologize. And it's like, you know, it's like, I can accept your apology. I can be the bigger person. It's almost like you reverted to being like an eight-year-old kid that was just like, if I don't get my way, I'm just going to throw a temper tantrum. I said, you know, you just can't act like that. You're not going to get your way if you act like that. So, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I would think in today's world he would be fired because. Well, I think eventually you know, I know he things, was, but they let yeah. me go first, which really pissed me off because they basically, you know, because I was in a subordinate role, you know, I was the administrative assistant and he was like a project manager so they, they kind of felt like, well, she's the one that's, you know, bringing the complaint. So I guess she's the problem. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'm the one. I mean, I've never been a person that wants to be a victim. I'm like, well, wait a minute. It's like, I'm just sitting here doing my job. And this guy, I mean, physically goes in and tears up my whole workspace. And I'm the problem. <laughs> I was like, you guys are nuts. <laughs> so it was a blessing in disguise. It was. It was really. <laughs> No, I I got laid off from my for the very first time in my life. I'd never been fired or, or laid off from a job, and it, this was back in two thousand. Was it two thousand sixteen? Mm. I forget. Anyway, two thousand sixteen. I think it was. And I went into human resources, and basically my position was eliminated, mm. which companies have every right to do. But this was a pre pretty big company, and I went into human resources, and I said, "You've got five thousand employees. There's got to be something for me to do mm -hmm. here, right?" And he looked at me and he goes, Sandy, this is a blessing in disguise. Oh. And I was like, oh, okay. And it was because, you know, it took about a month and I found the job that I'm currently in and I've been there, it'll be five years in May and it has been 
the best experience of my life. And he was right. So, Sean, if you're listening out there, thank you. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> well, sometimes you don't was, realize, you know, when you're, you know, you're just kind of going through life and you're doing your thing. And like, there's like little bumps. Or I call them sneaker waves. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. It's like, I wasn't ready for that. But it's kind of like, I think as I've gotten older, it's like, oh, there's a lesson in it. And you kind of have to sit back and think about, okay, you know, why, why me? Why now? Well, there's got to be a reason. I mean, my sister and her partner, they both work for a large corporation. And he had a similar thing happen about, oh, I think it's been about seven years ago. They both worked there for like, my sister's been at this company for 40 years. And he's oh been gosh. there for 30, almost 35 years. And he was on a sabbatical and the company was going through transitions. And they called him. <laughs> This is just this craziest story. They called him and they said, hey, pull over. And they he thought something had happened to my sister. And they said, we're sorry to tell you that, you know, we're uh, having to uh, downsize, um, you know, make some corporate changes. And, you know, your position's being eliminated. So his whole department, everybody that he'd worked with for all those years, about two thirds of them were laid off. So pretty traumatic being on the side of a road pulling over and being told that you just lost your job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but they had to do it, I guess, because of the fact that the company was going to come out the next day and they didn't want employees to learn on the news what was going on. So they were, you know, scrambling, you know, here in Oregon and Texas and some of their other locations to to let people know basically what was going on. Well, it's one of the hardest things for management to do. And like I'm in recruiting and I always joke with my boss, I report to our director of human resources and I always joke, I'm like, I just like to hire people. I don't want to be the one to fire anybody or let people go. Right. So that's why I love recruiting because I'm, you know, I'm giving people an opportunity. I'm helping them, which is my life's purpose. But I remember, gosh, years ago, I started an IT recruiting company and in 2003, the DC metro area it was like the internet burst throughout the Dulles corridor. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm out by Dulles Airport. So we had a lot of these IT companies that were making millions of dollars, right, in the stock market. Well, that can only last for so long. So it burst. And company after company went out of business. So when you're doing recruiting, nobody was hiring. So I held on to the company as long as I could, but it was costing my husband and I money out of our own pocket. Mm. And I had to, I had to let, let employees go. And I eventually had to just close it up completely. And I know that some of the people were, were very resentful of me and, and I get that. But at the end of the day, when you're a business owner, you know, business is business. Yeah, right. You can't, you can't. I mean, I was, I lost a couple hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. and you know, you can't keep paying people if you're not making any money. Right. So I learned I learned that the hard way, but it it is unfortunate when when you have to go through that type of thing. But in any and event, all companies do, unfortunately. I mean, you think yeah. you look at all these huge companies and you think, well, gosh, they're building all these buildings and they they must be doing well, and then they're laying off people that've been there for thirty years. It's like, well, and you know, same situation with my brother in law. It's like, well, what I couldn't understand is. You know, you've got all this experience. You've got people that know the, com you know, the corporate structure. And, you know, why wouldn't there be other, you know, positions available? And it's just like, well, that particular division wasn't making enough money. So we got to, you know, you know, cut it, cut it there and put our resources where the money's going to come in. Yeah, exactly. So you had, you had wrote me and, and told me, about how horses have really helped you. Oh, yeah. Talk to me about that, because you said you're starting to get back. So what's what's your history with horses? Because I love horses, too. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I was really blessed. Um, I grew up in kind of a rural area here in Oregon, and my grandmother had a love for horses. And so when we moved to this area when I was like, I think I was five, my grandmother had horses, and then my parents decided to get my sister and I some uh, ponies. So I had a Welch pony, we had a Shetland pony, and then my grandmother had, I think, three or four horses at that time. So it was just like, we'd get up, go to school, do our chores, and then every day, I swear, every day after school, as soon as I got everything done, I was out at the barn, and I was either feeding them or, you know, you know, cleaning stalls or riding out in the woods. I mean, we were pretty lucky. 
to have that kind of childhood. And then, you know, as I got older, parents are like, it's a big responsibility. You guys are in school. So, you know, the horses got sold. And so I don't know I was about 45, 50. I'm like, and I've always loved horses. Every time we go on vacation, it's like, I want to go ride. I just decided I wasn't at a point where I wanted to buy a horse, but leasing is a big thing. You can lease right. a horse. So basically, you know, it's like, it's a great opportunity to be able to ride and not have the full responsibility of having to you know, the vet and feeding and everything. So I started doing that about mm, 10 years ago. And I've leased a few horses and um, have met some really fun people. And my current situation is I have a horse. She's probably about 30 miles away. It's out in a rural area. The owner's great. She's got another horse in the pasture. And I just go out and, you know, after work, Run weekends and just hang out with the horses, and they have llamas and goats and stuff too. So it kind of brings me back to my childhood a little bit. That's great. Now, you mentioned it has something to do with your creativity. Yeah, I don't know what it is about horses. I know growing up, if I'd get frustrated or, you know, didn't want to deal with stuff that was going on in the house, I would go out to my, my grandmother lived next door to us. So she had her property, and then our house was just real close. And I'd just go out to the barn and hang out with the horses. And I love to read. So I'd go out and read books or I'd write. And I think just kind of being out in nature, being outdoors. So it's always kind of an outdoorsy kid. I don't know. I just, you know, you get out and you walk in the woods and, you know, listening to the birds. And you just start thinking about, you know, stories and, you know, different things that you can create. It's kind of fun. <laughs> So did that inspire you to write your children's books? Yeah, actually, one day, I've always enjoyed writing. And the last few years, I've been going to writing, writing conferences, just trying to get a feel for what kind of things to, can I write. Took a memoir class and, and I thought children's books would be fun because I actually work in education. Uh, I've been doing that for like the last 15 years. And so I was out riding one day and I just had this thought, I'm like, oh, I could write a book about a young girl and horses because there's so many kids that ride, you know, either English or Western or just for pleasure in the UK and the United States. And I thought that would be a fun book to write. So I just kind of started playing with the idea. And then with COVID, I had gotten my illustrations done and kind of when COVID hit, I thought, now I've got all this time on my hands to actually kind of work on this. So that's kind of how it all got started. Now, have, have your books been published yet? Yeah, actually, I published it in December. Uh, I have it self-published. I originally Great. thought I'd go the traditional route, but I've learned a lot about that. It's a real learning process if you want to be a published yes, writer. Yes. So what's the name of the book? It's called Sierra and Star. And Sierra is uh, the little girl in character. And then Star is the horse. And tell the listeners a little bit about it. Okay. Well, Sierra, she's eight years old and she has, her parents will give her like dolls and stuff for her birthdays, you know, typical little girls, you know, and she's kind of not a fan of dolls. She would prefer to have a pony. Well, of course, that's a big thing for a parent to do for a child. And so she goes to the neighbors and they have a horse and she spends time with their horse, Stormy. And then on her eighth birthday, her mom and dad tell her to go outside and the front lawn, she sees this beautiful red pony. And that's kind of the preface of the story is that they start to bond and build a relationship together. And so she teaches her how to jump. So she takes her out in the woods and they're jumping logs. And then at school one day, she sees this poster for like a competition for um, kids and their ponies. And so she comes home and asks her parents, hey, I saw this competition and you think that's something I could do? And her parents say, well, you know, that's a big responsibility and if it's something you want to do, you're going to have to work really hard. So basically the story is about, you know, having a dream and then having to work hard to make your dreams come true. I love it. I love that. Yeah, that's the great. illustrations are great. I got really lucky. I found a wonderful illustrator. Her name's Marion Gorin. She lives in Spain, and she's originally from England. And um, when I first started looking for illustrators, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like, you know, 
shooting from the hip. So I got online and just started looking and I kind of had an idea in my head of the kind of art that I like. So I looked and looked and finally I, I found her and I emailed her and I said, Hey, I've got this story. Do you think you could, you know, show me stuff that you've done that you'd be able to do something like that? Cause a lot of her work is like animals and birds and nature. And she pulled it off. I mean, it's like, I was happily surprised when she started sending me the sketches. It's like, this is going to be so much fun. So the process I've really, really enjoyed. And now um, I'm working on my second book. You could probably do a series out of that. <laughs> yeah, I could. The only problem is I was thinking of that when I originally started, but she, she has gotten so busy and is doing so much work that she doesn't really have time. And so I developed another story and I'm actually working with a relative who is really talented and she has a friend that's super talented. So they're kind of collaborating together on the art. So I'm writing the story and they're working on the uh, illustrations. That is exciting. Yeah, that is really exciting. And I, yeah, my son, I think it was basketball. He has a friend, you know, when he was in, he's now in college, but one of his friend's moms writes children's books. And and I find that just, yeah, like I, I've written a novel and, and now I have a self-help book. But, you know, everybody has a different writing style and a different way to write. Like children's books to me just seem so much more complicated because you're getting on that level of the way the child thinks. Right, right. You kind of have to think. I mean, the thing I learned is you really have to, I mean, I started from scratch. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. And so I'd like go to bookstores and actually sit and read children's books and, you know, look at the art. And there's, depending on the age, you know, there's uh, early readers, which my book is for early readers. Um, There's YA novels, which are very popular. And then there's kind of the in-between, like eight to 12 years old. So you really have to think about what age of child do you want to write for? Do you want to write for little ones, you know, for a little bit older kids, or you want to write about teens. And I work with teens, so I didn't really... What do you do? Yeah, I work in a high school as a a student supervisor. Oh, okay. I could probably write a book about teens, but um, (laughs) I think it would probably be a comedy um, just because (laughs) of the things that kids say. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean... You know, it's kind of like I'm a dorm mom and they'll come up and ask, you know, advice about just all kinds of things like, you know, their parents or their boyfriends or their girlfriends. And sometimes I just have to laugh at some of the stuff these kids say to me. But that's such an important role because I know with my son, he didn't have the assistance or guidance, or maybe it was just that he didn't connect with his guidance counselor. And because I, I really thought she was a lovely woman and, and I thought she was really great. But for whatever reason, my son, you know, may not have connected with her. But the secretary that worked in the counseling, you know, mm-hmm. office, she was like the mom for all the kids. And she was like the one person who really was there for my son when he needed it the most mm-hmm. and helped him. And because, you know, he he and I are very, very close, but I'm his mom. Right. right? You still, you know, it, it really takes a village oh. when you're raising children. Right. And and I'm just so grateful. It was like this woman and like two of his teachers that, you know, he, it's like, I don't think I could have made it out of high school if it wasn't for these three people. And, kind and of I'm so proud of him because along the way. Yeah. And he, he actually, you know, after he graduated, you know, he, and back and told them and thanked them and, and he bought them gifts and, you know, yeah. like you, he, you helped me get through this. And so, yeah, it's a very, very important role. And yeah, I think that light bulb goes off because, you know, a lot of times, you know, their brains aren't fully formed and, and I right. think they get to maybe 23, 24 and then they realize, wow, I mean, those people really did help me, you know, at the time, sometimes they think that they're, we're just being hard on them, but it's like, we're just trying to teach you that, you know, life's not always easy. And if you don't, if you don't get the work done, if you don't, you know, you know, want to learn. I mean, I tell kids, you know, especially the ones that don't like to read. I said, the thing about reading is you learn so much and you have to learn to enjoy it. 
It's like, you know, there's certain subjects that you're not going to be good at. I mean, I know I'm not great at math. You know, I like more writing (laughs) and creativity stuff. I said, we're all wired differently. And I said, it's okay not to be perfect at everything. You know, because some parents, I think, really push their kids to be like, excel at everything. And it puts a lot of stress and, and pressure on them. And I just say, just be who you are and find something that you really like. Because it's like, you know, you're going to get out of high school. And if you go to college, then you're going to work for the next 50 years. So it's like, find something that you really like to do and that you feel good about getting up in the morning and going to. Because I said, yes, you know, if that's important, there's always other doors you can go through. I mean, if this doesn't work out, I met, a, well, I don't call him a kid, but we had a um, customer come in the other day that was a former student who talked about how he had gotten a baseball scholarship and that didn't kind of work out. But, you know, he seemed like a pretty well-rounded guy. And, you know, now he's like a, a manufacturing rep for a carpeting company as we're having some stuff redone in the school. And he's talked about, you know, I really appreciated my teachers when I was here. And it was kind of cool just to hear somebody that graduated 20 plus years ago come back and say how, you know, it made a difference in his life. Wow, yeah, th- there's nothing more rewarding than to hear that, for sure. So, Cherise, what else do you want to tell the listeners? Anything else that you want to share? Well, so I um, I haven't had a chance to read your book. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's only been out for two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I noticed that, and I like the cover. Um, Thank you. I just think, you know, if you've got something that you're really interested in, something that, you know, like for me... You know, I've always loved art. I mean, I love photography. I'm not a person that can draw. At least I don't think I can. But, you know, maybe to try to push yourself. You know, if you think you can't do it, maybe you can do it. I mean, I never thought I'd write a book. I've always enjoyed writing. And I just kind of pushed myself, you know, the last year and learned a lot. I mean, I've learned a lot. And just to keep learning and I think another thing is if in your situation where, you know, I talked about stand up for yourself and and um, don't let somebody else make you feel that you're not worthy, no matter what your situation in life is. You have to be able to, you know, the old phrase, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. <laughs> that is excellent, excellent advice. Yeah. Well, Cherise, thank you so much for joining me today. And I love your story. And uh, after the interview, I will share with everybody where to find your book as well. Okay, great. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks so much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. That was such a nice interview. She is such a sweet woman. So once again, Sharice Arthur, she has a children's book. Sierra and Star. You can find that on Amazon. She has a print version, Kindle version, and we'll be releasing the audio version sometime in March. So thank you for listening today. Please visit my website at sandyscarlotta.com. My book, Happiness Solved, Climbing 100 Steps, is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. You can get it in a Kindle version and in the print version. And at some point, I too will be having an audio version produced. Thank you again. And I hope that you and your family stay healthy and safe and that your lives are filled with peace, joy, and happiness. And remember, at any point, you can always press the reset button. Take care, everyone.